Hello everyone. On this video, I'm going to go over uh, the estimation of a time series model using Stata. So the data set I'm using uh, is a macro data set. So uh, we basically have three variables in this model. We have the real GDP in Japan, abbreviated as GDP-JP. We have the CPI in USA and we have unemployment rate in USA, okay? Uh, and we have other variables, but these are the variables that I'm going to focus on as just an example. Like I'm not going to uh, use all the variables I have in the model, so I'm going just to use these variables as an example. So uh, let's go ahead and import the data set. So, the data set, we have nine variables and 193 observations. Um, as we can see, it starts from 1957 all the way up to 2005. And it's a quarterly data set, so it's one, two, three, four per each year. We stop at the first quarter of 2005. So uh, <clears throat> when we generate, uh, when we uh, declare the data set in Stata, we have to <clears throat> generate it and tell Stata that it's a quarterly data set that starts from 1957 quarter one. And this is the way that we declare it. We tell Stata that the format is TQ, which is quarterly data set. If it is a monthly, so we write it TM. And then we rename the uh, TS time series data set as time one. So this is basically the way of declaring data set and telling Stata it's quarterly data set that starts from 1957 quarter one all the way to 2005 quarter one. And of course you can describe and summarize. So let's start by <coughs> doing some changes in these variables. Uh, we are not going to use the real GDP as it is, we're going to create economic growth. Uh, because this is typically, if I'm, if I'm using rate here, which is for, uh, sorry, for unemployment, then I'm going also to change this to inflation, uh, where inflation is the change in the log of the CPI. And we're going to change this variable, uh, which is the real GDP, into economic growth, which is the change in the log of real GDP. So this is exactly what we're doing here. We're just transforming the variables into rates. And um, for the first one, um, first of all, you get the log, as you know how to get how to get it. You can use log or lin. And then we're going to create a variable. Uh, I name it gr, which is growth, just to make it easier. And then it's d, which is the change. So d here stands for the first difference of the log of the change of the log of GDP uh, in JP. The same thing for inflation in the U.S. Uh, we are taking the CPI. Right? And this is the name for the CPI from the original data set, uh, PU, uh, PU new. And uh, we're going to create the log of the CPI. And then to make it easier, inflation is the change in the log of CPI. Um, unemployment is already in rates. I just rename it because I didn't like the LHUR. So I felt like this is easier to call it unemployment. Um, okay, this is a note for you in case you want to work in annual rates. Let's say you have unemployment in annual rates, you don't have it in uh, reported in quarterly rates. So you can always change any quarterly variable into yearly variable by multiplying it times um, four. Okay. So I'm not going to, do, to, to talk about this uh, now. I'm just going to talk about, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the variables in quarterly rates. So let's start by graphing. I, as I told you before, uh, graphing is always important so that you can um, see the, the, how the variable performs uh, over time. So for the growth in Japan, when we graph it, oh, maybe I'm just, sorry, I need to, uh, okay, so for the first one, which is the graph, as I can see, there are fluctuations 
that gets smaller and smaller over time and probably this area if I'm kind of doing um, a research on only this part definitely this is stationary uh, this one is somehow stationary like the mean uh, or the line fitting a line through all of these fluctuations is kind of stable but not a straight line so um, by looking at the graph we can say that definitely this part is stationary we're not 100% sure about this part is stationary of course this part is stationary uh, of course and then you can kind of get it into small small pieces that are stationary by each period but for the whole period it's kind of going um, down in a kind of non-steep curve or kind of flat curve I should say um, when I look at inflation okay so this is more of a non-stationary form it's going up reaching a certain maximum going down so it's kind of an inverted V shape if I try to fit at, uh, a line through all of these fluctuations there might be a possibility that there is a break in the data set here uh, as we're going to talk about it towards the end of this video so the, the quarterly inflation rate in the US doesn't seem to be stationary however if I try to find out if I have a break in the data set and account for this break that can make the series kind of a straight, relatively straight line um, like the trend of the series in a relatively straight line then I might be able to say it's stationary but just looking at the graph def definitely it's not stationary unemployment it looks similar to real GDP they always match kind of each other uh, both are reflection of the state of the economy usually when GDP is going down inflation uh, is going up and vice versa so it it looks similar to the real GDP right and um, and uh, yeah so it's kind of kind of going up relatively down whether it's stationary we're not 100% sure we need to test it so actually for the three series this is the most stationary one this is the second stationary one and this is the least stationary series by just looking at the graph um, there are different ways of checking how a series is related to its past values uh, one of the things that we can use is Corellogram so the Corellogram uh, command has different format you can do it just this way which is Corellogram growth you can do it on each series by itself um, and there are actually many options you can actually type core, uh, Corgram which is the command and type GR without lags you can specify certain number of lags like you're concerned about the past eight quarters and nothing else uh, this one would bring for you a graph this one does not this one uh, you're specifying certain period of time you just like as you can see I'm specifying the whole period so you can um, change this and kind of uh, choose whatever period of time you want to plot this uh, Corellogram for so if I do it this way I would get a plot okay this one is telling me that this is the autocorrelation of GDP today with its first quarter autocorrelation of GDP today with second quarter and again GDP today with three quarters in the past and so on um, as you can see the autocorrelation here was 0 0.5 Five, six increased 50 52 kind of keeps fluctuating but the general trend is the 0 0.5 just kind of disappears like you keep going down more uh, if you change this to longer series this kind of dampen over time um, the autocorrelation let's say uh, with lag 2 might be picking up the effect of lag 1 and 3 might be picking up the effect of 1 and 2 so partial autocorrelation is more 
filtered is more specific it is exactly the same as doing it in a regression like a this is the coefficient of an ar1 ar2 ar3 and so on um, however as you can uh, notice that the partial autocorrelation uh, is similar to let's say when i say ar1 uh, it's supposed to be the coefficient of yt minus 1. Uh, however, if I do it yt minus 2, this is an autocorrelation conditional on yt minus 1 being uh, taken into consideration or uh, holding it constant. Same here. As you can notice, the number gets smaller as compared to the numbers here because the bias is taken care of. You're taking care of the bias. In, in other words, you're taking care of the factors that might be absorbed in these autocorrelations. Right? So this one, the pure effect of lag 4, this is the effect of lag 4 that might be picking up the effect of 3, 2, and 1. Um, all right? So uh, these two numbers are actually supposed to be the same because... A R, uh, sorry, partial autocorrelation with lag 1 supposed to be exactly the same number with AC1. So it might be just if we uh, approximate this one, it'd be like 0.51 and the same thing here. But usually we should get like exactly the same number. Um, okay, so th as you can see, okay, so this is the Q test, which is the Pierce box test. Um, and the Pierce box test, uh, it's easy to read it with the probability because it basically says, like the null hypothesis says, no autocorrelation uh, and it accumulates. So, for example, this number is about the sum of autocorrelations of autocorrelation 1, autocorrelation 2, autocorrelation 3. And it's giving me 162.72. It's cumulative right and the number keeps on increasing because it's cumulative uh, of course you can take these numbers and compare it with a chi-square with for example here with eight degrees of freedom this one with seven degrees of freedom and so on um, or you can use the p-value i prefer to use the p-value because i don't have to refer to any table and this one is simply telling me there is a zero probability of autocorrelation with or cumulative autocorrelation up to a uh, lag eight, okay. Uh, there is a zero probability of no autocorrelation up to lag seven. So all of them are actually telling me there is a significant or there is a statistical significant autocorrelation in this model, okay. Um, this one is again autocorrelation that ranges from negative to negative one to one. It's an it's a correlation by the end of the day. It's just a correlation that ranges from negative one to positive one. Same for the partial. This one I like to look at this one because it's showing me the pure effect of lags over time that is kind of getting smaller, smaller, smaller as I go back in the past and kind of disappears. These are just the graphical presentation of these numbers. Okay, again, these numbers are actually supposed to be the same. I'm just wondering why they are slightly different, different, but I should say it might be just the approximation. Um, okay, all right, so next. It is very important to get all the variables in a model stationary. We want the variables not to be dependent on time. We want the variables not to have any break because either having a break or having um, a unit root implies that the variable is non-stationary. So we need to perform a unit root test. The famous way of performing a unit root test is the Dickey-Fuller test. Dickey-Fuller test has different formats depending on whether you want a time trend in your model, whether you want this intercept in your model, uh, or you do not want a time trend, or you do not want an intercept. So uh, I have for you here the different formats. So this one is basically, it doesn't have a trend, 
line. Let me just maximize this for now. So this one, it doesn't have a trend, right? Uh, and doesn't have an intercept. So I'm saying no constant. So don't include a drift. Drift is simply an intercept in time series. Um, this one, I'm telling theta to include a trend. Uh, and I didn't say no constant, so this, very, this model includes an intercept or a drift. In my model, as I have seen the growth, inflation, and unemployment graphs, I can see that they start with a certain intercept or drift. I don't see a time trend. Actually, this happens for the three, right? So I didn't write... Uh, actually, it's supposed to be for the three. So actually, it's for the three. I can tell that the three um, start with a certain intercept. I don't see a time trend, so I'm going to perform a Dickey Fuller test on each one separately. Uh, and assuming that I have an intercept or drift and no time trend. Uh, also, uh, the test is performed in each time series, again, separately. The number of lags, you can change this number. Uh, by default, we usually start by four, which is the maximum number of lags that we would include in a model with such number of, it's not like many number of, of like many observations. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going just to start with four lags. You can change it uh, later. So how can we perform this test? Performing this test, you will get this output, okay? Um, this is the test statistic, and these are the critical values, so you don't have to go to a table to check your critical values. Because the, uh, we have certain assumptions in time series models, we cannot simply use the Z table or the, 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 the cumulative normal distribution table that we have on the back of, tech, of our textbook. Um, using time series models and changing many of the assumptions such that the non-stationarity assumption, then we will need to change the critical values uh, to match these types of assumptions that we have in time series. So one of the... Um, uh, critical values used uh, here in the Dickey Fuller test are actually like they are actually uh, created in a paper by McKinnon and the actual um, paper, if you Google search the paper, you would find the critical values and how uh, it was derived um, in the paper itself. But the good news is like in Stata, they ha we have it right here. Okay, so again, if I don't have the time series assumptions, I can just go ahead and use the Z table or the normal distribution table as we usually do with, uh, with the p-value as we uh, did since the beginning of the semester uh, with the p-value of the coefficients in terms of their statistical uh, significance. However, here, because of the assumption of non-stationarity and other assumptions that we have in the time series model, we are going to stick to these critical values. So you just look at this number, and the it is very important to remember what is your null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is basically saying, I have unit root. So I want to kind of reject uh, the null. Right? Because in this situation, you want to reject the null so that you can conclude, I don't have a unit root. So as we can see, the negative 1.937 falls in the acceptance region. It's smaller than all critical values. So you fail to reject. And accordingly, you have a unit root in growth. Despite the fact when we looked at the graph, we couldn't 100% say we have a stationary or non-stationary model. But performing a test confirms that we have an unstationary growth, right? Um, the same thing, so the conclusion, growth has a unit root since the, in absolute terms, 193 is less than all critical values, okay? In absolute terms. So we're just making sure that 
just take the absolute terms or we can talk about it in terms of the negative it's okay um, let's do the second one we actually get similar results this is actually worse because we, we were able to see that inflation is definitely non-stationary so um, this one again falls in the acceptance region or we fail to reject we have a unit root the same thing for unemployment the number again uh, falls in the acceptance region uh, and then we fail to reject okay so um, the conclusion is basically the three are less than for critical values in absolute terms and um, and accordingly, we basically say that we have unit root in the three um, series, or in other words, the GR in unemployment are non are non station. Okay, so how can we overcome this problem? Overcoming this problem is uh, taking first difference. So if I can get a variable in first difference, this would reduce the non-stationarity problem. So each and every variable here, I'm going to get it in first difference. So the first difference of GR, we just get G dot, get me the, the first difference in GR, get me the first difference in inflation, and then I'm renaming them, adding a DDD, so it just makes it easier to um, to uh, work with it and remember the abbreviation. So just add a D before the variable and this implies this variable in first difference. And remember when you perform the Dickey Fuller test on D growth, if I started with four and I did the first difference, then my next test has to have less number of lags. And performing the test, let me, let me do it on the three uh, okay, I'm sorry. It's just I need to run these first. Okay. So uh, the first one, as you can see, we are in the rejection region. We're rejecting the null that we have a unit root. Same here. Rejecting the null of a unit root. Rejecting the null of a unit root. Then we can say that we rejected the null. So we have no unit root. Or DGR, DN. Okay, it's just like I'm, I added the um, unemployment um, towards the end of creating this graph, uh, I mean this do file. So they are uh, stationary and it's very important to tell me it's stationary in first difference. When variable is stationary in first difference, we call it I1. So GR itself, like the original series, would be stationary if I get the first difference, so we call it I1. And the same thing for inflation and unemployment. Suppose that I did the first difference and the variable is still non-stationary. I would go ahead and do the second difference. And if I do the second difference, I will call it I2. Okay? So next, we have to uh, uh, work with these variables in a stationary format. So from now on, using these variables in this do file, I won't be able to work with the original series because the original series are uh, non-stationary. But I would be able to work in with these variables in first difference because this is the only format that makes it stationary. Um, for those of you who are interested in knowing how to perform the DF test manually, you can check it here, up to here. Okay, um, I did it on inflation, but you can go ahead and repeat it on uh, the other two variables. Um, it's very important to note that performing the test manually is not part of the materials for the final exam. This is just for your own learning. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want to know how the DF test is performing in the background, then just follow, uh, like follow this part of the do file just for your learning. Okay. 
All right, uh, let me stop here and then I will continue recording in the next video.